Hi, I'm Camelin. And I'm Max. Welcome to Fort Hoskins Historic Park. Why don't you come take a walk with us? Back in the 70s, we, in our wildest imagination, this is not something I would have foreseen, that we could have actually found an original structure and get it back here on the site. In terms of kind of significance, you know, in, in the broadest term, is kind of adding that story we don't get from the historic record. I'd never heard of the Civil War in Oregon, and what's going on? How did an average soldier live in the coast range of the Pacific Northwest during the Civil War? The answer was here. Ready. Aim. Fire. It's this multi-dimensional multi you know, exploration of the past, and then you pull it all together and you can start breathing life into this part of Oregon history. Welcome to Fort Hoskins Historic Park. The site consists of 128 acres and was opened to the public in 2002. The U.S. Army built Fort Hoskins in 1856. The 200 to 300 troops that served here were charged with protecting and monitoring the newly established Coast Salette's Indian Reservation. Located at the crossroads of two major trails, the fort quickly became a regional center of economic and political activity. No Indian battles were ever fought at Fort Hoskins. Unlike other western forts, Fort Hoskins has no stockade wall, no blockhouse, and was surrounded only by a picket fence. From here, you can see the Lucky Mute River named for the Lucky Mute Band of Kalapuya Indians who once maintained a village on the valley floor. The Kalapuya managed the landscape by setting fires to encourage growth of food plants for better forage for game animals and to prevent catastrophic wildfires. The Kalapuya relied on plants like camas, tarweed, and white oak for food and used hazel, rushes, and bear grass for making baskets, mats, and various tools. When the Civil War ended, the fort decommissioned and buildings were torn down, moved, or sold off. Samuel and Mary France purchased the fort property and built this house on the site of the military infirmary. They replaced the barracks with barns, a blacksmith shop, and other farm structures. There's the hubs! Fire! <laughs> we are standing on the parade grounds of the once bustling Western Military Fort. The fort was occupied by U.S. infantry troops and later by the volunteers from the Oregon, California, and Washington. Built in this area were three officer quarters, a large enlisted men's barracks, a powder magazine, and a root cellar. The adjutant's office, this flagpole, and the guardhouse. Along the east side were a large warehouse, bakery, and laundry. Buildings featured running water piped from an uphill spring. The soldiers' job of keeping peace between the settlers and Native Americans was diminished by the early 1860s. During the Civil War, the fort provided a valuable Union presence in Oregon and may have kept the secessionist movement in the mid Willamette Valley from erupting into an armed conflict. Through my career as a, an archaeologist, I'm fascinated, particularly in the historic period, by the chapters that have been left out of our history books. And I'd never heard of the Civil War in Oregon. And what's going on? Fire! So the first thing we start with is kind of using the historical record and historic maps. Um, and then we identify with the historic maps kind of the landforms we see. And based on that, we go out and we kind of shoot grids into where we think those building locations are. 
And then through a process of kind of archaeology, we identify, you know, archaeological features, you know, artifacts, scatters, foundation stones, and that'll kind of narrow us in kind of exactly where we're at, the footprint of those buildings. And beyond that, if you ask a simple question, how did an average soldier live in the coast range of the Pacific Northwest during the Civil War? The answer was here. Everything, they, their, their uniform styles, their, what they ate, what they ate on, all the material culture, their daily lives, are at this site. So Justin, tell me what's the most interesting thing you found today? Uh, today is probably the most interesting thing we found is a 36 caliber round ball, probably using a 36 caliber Navy uh, revolver. Um, for typical sidearm of kind of the officers during the period. In terms of kind of significance, you know, in, in the broadest terms, kind of adding that story we don't get from the historic record, you know, the women and children. Um, you know, but other things such as kind of status, you know, we get a lot of status and authority, you know, objects, you know, high, you know, um, value ceramics, um, you know, can really tell us, kind of complicate the history. Um, particularly from this floor, we get a lot of variation of military uniform parts, you know, buttons, insignia, and that kind of has given us a whole other perspective on kind of what the uniforms look like out here. And by studying the material culture, it then gets you into some of the individual soldiers. As you do the archival work, you, you know, occasionally letters pop up, diaries pop up, and it's this multi-dimensional, you know, exploration of the past that begins here with the artifact and then takes us further into other material and then you pull it all together and you can start breathing life into this part of Oregon history. Now, as I said, there are nine different steps to loading this weapon. Now we'll talk them through as a drill sergeant like me would when I'm tra training new recruits. Load in nine times, load. Handle, cartridge. Tear, cartridge. Charge, cartridge. Draw, rammer. Ram, cartridge. Return, rammer. Prime. Company, ready. Aim. Fire. Recover arms. That is each and every step that a soldier would have to take to load and fire his weapon in time of battle. Perhaps unnecessary steps, but if you're using something that may save your life or take another life, it's necessary to go through each and every step to learn it. The Confederated Tribes of the Slitz Indians and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde have ancient origins in Western Oregon. Their ancestors ceded approximately 20 million acres to the United States in the 1850s under treaties promising a permanent reservation. In 1855, President Franklin Pierce created the Coast Slitz Reservation. Many Western Oregon tribes were marched and permanently located there to form the Confederated Tribes of the Slitz Indians. In 1857, President James Buchanan confirmed the boundaries of the Grand Ronde Reservation, which had been established in 1856, primarily for the Willamette and Umpqua Valley tribes. The first settlers in Kings Valley were a party of 25 people led by Nahum King, who settled here in 1846. After crossing the Oregon Trail, they found fertile open prairies and oak groves the Kalapuya had managed for thousands of years. The homesteaders converted the flood plains and foothill prairies for growing crops and as pastures for their livestock. The timbered uplands offered fuel, lumber, and hunting grounds for wild game. With the end of the Civil War in April 1865, Fort Hoskins was decommissioned. Buildings from the fort site were sold off, moved, burned, or left on site. The commander's house stayed at Fort Hoskins and was used by the Franz family. 
1869, the commander's house was moved eight miles away to the small town of Petey, Oregon. In 2012, the house was brought back here to its original location in the fort. Efforts are being made to restore the house to its original condition and to use it as an interpretive center. On this foundation, a small elementary school was established in 1915 for about 20 children, first through eighth grade. Because of the rainy winter seasons, it was often too muddy for kids to make it to school. For this reason, the academic school year was only four months long, ranging from April to July. <laughs> 